The session chairperson is Mr. Habil Khorakiwala, Chairman Wakhad Limited and President Fiki. May I request the speaker and the chairperson to be seated on the dais please. Mr. Habil Khorakiwala is currently President of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry and he is the Chairman of Wakhad Limited a leading biotechnology and pharmaceutical company. Sir, may I request you to chair the session and introduce the speaker. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Just as there is a limit to how, how fast the mile can be run, there is probably, probably a limit to how far the human lifespan can be extended. And every now and again, the strongest runner completely transforms ideas of what is possible. Today, man can live, is living at about 70 years on this planet. Only a century ago, he used to live only 40 years. In India, 60 years ago, we, the age, average age was 27. It's up by nearly 40 years. Science has helped to lengthen our lives. Not only add years to our lives, but add life to our years through hundreds of innovations that we take for granted today. We have to thank medical science for discoveries of vaccines like smallpox, polio, diphtheria and many more which has dramatically reduced infant mortality. Discovery of antibiotics has eradicated and eliminated many infectious diseases. And the discovery of insulin has helped manage diabetes, a lifestyle disease that is spreading like wildfire. Modern anesthesia and surgical innovation have progressed to such an extent that virtually every organ except the brain can be transplanted. Many medicines have been invented to treat heart diseases, depression, cancer, arthritis and many more other diseases. And all this has happened in last hundred years. There was a middle-aged woman who got suddenly a heart attack and was moved to a hospital. In an operating theatre, she got the uh, calling of the God and asked, and she, she asked the God, okay, how long am I going to live? And God said, you will live another 40 years, 8 months and 2 days. And then she recovered from the hospital and she said, since I have to live so long, let me go properly into the world once again. So she got her nose job done, her facelift done, liposuction and also changed color of her hair. And she, she just left the hospital and she was run over by a bus and died. And then she went back and asked the God, okay, what happened? You promised me I'll live for another 40 years and I'm back in a few days. The God said, I did not recognize you. <laughs> How many of us recognize many people and many people wonder if progress and science are contributing to modern disease? Some even wonder if the increased lifespan is worth the trouble. Human progress of which increased lifespan is only a part has certainly not been an unmixed blessing. Urbanization, pollution, stress, and sedentary living have dramatically increased 
the incidence of many diseases like diabetes, cardiac problem, and so on. An increased lifespan has compounded geriatric problems like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. But is living more years worthwhile? I am reminded of about a cartoon caption which said, My goal is to die before there is a technical, technological breakthrough that forces me to live 130 years. Our Indian scriptures say the human body is biologically designed to live for 120 years or so. This is also what modern science tells us. The decoding of human genomes, which you have just heard in the earlier session, has led to exciting possibilities. Scientists say men living till 100 will, not, will, will no longer be news in the next few decades. And the other day, in, the India Today reporter asked a 104 years old woman, And, uh, she, and the question was, okay, what do you think of living 104 years? What do you feel about that? And she replied, I have no peer pressure. <laughs> but the question we have to ask today is whether living longer goes hand in hand with living a healthier and happier life. Several studies claim that happiness tends to grow with age, but everyday experience tends to be otherwise. <clears throat> it is said people get better at handling challenges as they age. Over the years, people also change their goals, making success and happiness more likely. Experts say older people are more able to pursue goals they enjoy and believe in helping them to be happier with their lives. But are we happier than our forefathers who did not live so long? Were they less happy because their lives were shorter? People are mortally afraid of old age, disease like dementia, Alzheimer, Parkinson's. Indeed, most people would prefer to die than to live indefinitely with such disease. No wonder the clamor for euthanasia grows louder. The ultimate question is whether living longer is desirable and worthwhile. I have no answers. Can integrative medicine make old age more livable and enjoyable? Today, we have a person of great eminence. And I have great pleasure in introducing to you Dr. Andrew Whale, physician, author, professor of integrative medicine at Jackson University. I am sure he will have answers to some of the questions. Dr. Vail has devoted the past 30 years to developing and practicing and teaching the principle of integrative medicine. He is the founder director of the program in integrative medicine at the College of Medicine, University of Arizona. Dr. Well is a best-selling author of Spontaneous Healing, Eight Weeks to Optimum Health, Health Aging, a Lifelong Guide to Your Physician, Physical and Spiritual Well-Being. He is also the editor-director of drwell.com, an online resource for healthy living based on the philosophy of integrative medicine. I have now great pleasure to presenting to you Dr. Andrew Well. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank the organizers of the Conclave for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Despite the undeniable advances of conventional medicine and scientific medicine in the past hundred years, we are now headed for a global crisis of health care. Uh, and I think that unless we come to uh, solve this, it has the potential to sink us all and disrupt all of the economic growth that we see in many places. The good news is I think there are solutions to this crisis, but they require 
out of the box thinking, the development of new paradigms of medicine and of healthcare. And at the moment, I don't see too much of that. But I also want to uh, give you a message today that I think India may be in a very unique position to be the place where these new models can be can develop and can be demonstrated. The basic problem is that allopathic medicine has become much too expensive to deliver to the people who need it. So the first question is why has medicine become so expensive? Why are these costs spiraling out of control? I think there are several reasons for this. Some of them are beyond our control and some of them ironically have to do with the very successes of scientific medicine. By rolling back acute infectious illness as the primary cause of premature disability and death in the early part of the 20th century, we left ourselves with chronic degenerative illness. And that, by nature, is much more difficult to reverse or treat, much more expensive to intervene in. So we've changed the nature of illness to make it much more difficult for ourselves. We have also, through medical advances, enabled people to live longer. And that is a mixed blessing because the greatest uh, health care expenses are incurred in the latter years of life. The fact is that in many parts of the world today, especially in the developed nations, the oldest old are the fastest growing segment of the population. Actually, centenarians in many parts of the world are the fastest growing segment of the human population. You know, much has been written about this. In countries like the U.S., in Japan, we are witnessing an unprecedented demographic change. Never before in human history will such a large percentage of the population be in the ranks of the old and the oldest old. This has enormous political, economic, and social consequences. But one of them, a very immediate one of them, is that it's going to cause an enormous escalation in health care costs. Now, I can tell you from my vantage point in the United States, our health care system is already on the verge of total collapse. I think many people there are feeling that, but have no idea of the implications of it and have no sense of how complete and total that collapse is going to be. I mean, already in my country, many hospitals are going bankrupt, especially smaller and community hospitals. And I, one can envision a time in the not distant future when large areas of the country will be left with only one central hospital, which is the only one that will be able to afford all of the technological hardware and scientific advances. And a lot of the other service centers simply won't be there anymore. Uh, Health care costs have risen so much that they are now crippling U.S. corporations. Uh, a year ago, the CEO of General Motors in a speech said that uh, U.S. corporations were now unable to compete effectively in international markets because they were crippled by health care costs at home. Now, where, where is this going? And if this is the situation now, imagine what happens when the baby boomers, this huge population bulge, which is just entering the ranks of senior years, hits those years when they develop the diseases of aging and become an, an even greater burden on the health care system. And then if you look at the other age of the uh, other end of the age spectrum, you see this generation of fat kids that we're raising in America and elsewhere. Uh, morbid obesity has now begun to develop at ages as young as two and three in certain uh, subpopulations. This is being followed closely by an epidemic of type 2 diabetes. And diabetes experts tell us that the health consequences, especially the cardiovascular consequences of type 2 diabetes, develop on average 10 to 15 years after diagnosis. That means we can expect to see an epidemic of coronary heart disease in men in their late 20s and early 30s, something we've never seen before. Actually, that's already started to happen. A friend of mine who is an internist who's, who's in my program in integrative medicine now tells me that a rule that he always operated by was that if a young man comes to an emergency uh, room with acute chest pain, that you never had to think of doing an extensive workup because the chance that this was anything serious was negligible. He says, now you have to consider the possibility that this is a heart attack. So this is an entirely new kind of disease in a different population than we've ever seen before. So the combination of these two things, that is a a generation of unhealthy kids, and experts tell us that this may be the first generation of American kids who will not live as long as their parents uh, because of, this, of the rise of the type 2 diabetes and the implications of that. And at the other end, this enormous population bulge of old people is surely going to sink the system. 
Also, consider the fact that the United States, the richest country in the world, which spends more per capita on health care than any other country by an enormous margin, has the worst health outcomes of any of the developed nations. So we are spending more per capita by a huge margin than any of the other NATO countries, and by any measure of health outcomes, whether it's infant mortality, uh, longevity, we are at the bottom. What's wrong with that picture? And in addition, at over 40% of our population is uninsured and has no access to the, these great advances in scientific medicine that we've heard about. It seems to me that what's wrong with that picture very clearly is that we're spending our money in the wrong ways. And I think the lesson to be learned from the experience in the United States applies elsewhere as well. The basic problem is that we are not spending money on the promotion of health. We are spending money on the intervention of established disease, and that's a losing proposition. But we need to spend money in ways that incentivize people and educate them about living according to the to principles that enhance health and protect health. It is quite true that the, the diseases that now absorb most of our health care dollars are diseases of lifestyle. But how are we teaching kids about adopting healthy lifestyles. This should be the highest priority in education. At the youngest ages possible, we should begin to teach kids about how to eat properly, about how to maintain habits of physical activity that will last them throughout life, about how to practice simple methods of neutralizing the harmful effects of stress. I don't see any of this being done. And in almost every area of healthcare that I look at, the priorities seem to me exactly 180 degrees off from where they should be. I'll give you one very dramatic example of what I mean, but I think this is symbolic of the, of the general problem. About uh, a year and a half ago, the New York Times ran a very detailed and good <coughs> four-part series on the type 2 diabetes epidemic in New York and the economic implications of it particularly. Uh, the, this is a devastating um, epidemic of disease in that population. And kids of very young ages are affected. Uh, the article pointed out that uh, especially immigrant children are very much affected, especially Asian kids. And interestingly, East Asian kids, Chinese, Japanese, <laughs> Koreans, are susceptible to type 2 diabetes at much lower weights than other ethnic groups. So often they develop this disease before the development of morbid obesity simply by switching to a mainstream American diet high in processed food and fast food. One of the articles looked at the, did an economic analysis of type 2 diabetes and pointed out that in the past couple of years many diabetes treatment centers and clinics had gone out of business. There was a very disturbing chart printed that looked at the costs and profits made in the treatment and care of type 2 diabetes. And the article showed that for every preventive nutritional consultation that was done, for every preventive eye consultation, for every preventive foot consultation, these clinics and centers lost on an average of $140. For every amputation of a diabetic limb, they made $6,000. So how can it be otherwise? This is the way the whole system is set up. There is no reimbursement for a physician to sit with a patient and counsel them about how to eat or to teach them simple stress reduction exercises. There is every financial incentive to order tests, to do diagnostic procedures, to use interventions, to prescribe drugs, all of the things that are expensive. And I think the other, to me, the other problem and why I say a new paradigm is necessary is that modern allopathic medicine has become much too dependent on technology. And that technology is inherently expensive. There is no way around that problem. If all of our thinking in terms of intervening in disease is based on high-tech solutions, then we are paying bills that are never going to go down. And the problem here is that physicians and, and other ancillary health personnel are simply not trained in, in simpler, low-tech, low-cost methods of intervention often methods which have existed in other cultures at other times, which have worked very well for people in other parts of the world, they simply are not taught this in medical school. A glaring omission is that basic nutrition is still not taught 
in medical schools. Uh, the total instruction I got in nutrition in four years at Harvard Medical School and a year of internship was 30 minutes, which were grudgingly allowed to a dietitian in one hospital I worked at in Boston to tell us about special diets we could order for patients. That has not changed substantially since I've been out of medical school. And even when, when schools say they teach nutrition, when I look at what they teach, it's really biochemistry, and it's buried in biochemistry courses, and it's forgotten as soon as biochemistry exams are taken. And there are tremendous consequences of this ignorance. One of them is that in the U.S. now, over 40% of our hospitals have fast food restaurants on their premises. These are, this is the food service provided in the hospital. I mean, what kind of an example are we setting for people by that? And there's complete complacency about this. This is seen as a good financial deal for the hospital. Nobody sees the absurdity of offering this kind of food in a medical setting. Um, in addition, I think that the, the nutritional illiteracy of the medical profession allows the the pressures of corporations that make food and the stupidity of governments that should be doing something in this area to just run rampant over good sense. If the medical profession were literate about nutrition, it could stand up as a potent social and political counterweight to those pressures. Again, let me just give you an example of what I mean. A couple of years ago, I was asked to be a keynote speaker at a much publicized uh, summit on the obesity crisis in America that was sponsored by Time Magazine and ABC News. And I was very offended at many things that I heard there. For one thing, the federal government was pushing very hard the line that obesity is purely a matter of individual responsibility. This was when our then Secretary of Health and Human Services said that the solution was for Americans to do sit-ups in front of the television. Uh, the the, there was also a panel that I sat there through of had the uh, major PR people for Coca-Cola, McDonald's, uh, Nestle, and a couple of other companies. To listen to them, you would have thought these were health food corporations. And their position is that they are just giving people what they want. They see no responsibility on their part to try to shape tastes or to move tastes in better directions. Now, how can the federal government in our country say that its hands are clean when if you go to a supermarket in America, the cheapest calories that you can buy are all of the low-quality carbohydrate foods, all of the snack foods made with uh, pro-inflammatory fats like uh, like refined soy oil, for example, and products sweetened with high fructose corn syrup, both very suspect culprits in the obesity epidemic. And the reason those are cheap is because there are federal government subsidies which artificially depress the, price, the prices of those crops, whereas the most expensive calories you can buy are fruits and vegetables because there are no federal subsidies to those crops. So it's stacked completely unfairly against consumers. Now, this is not a matter of individual responsibility. It's a matter of collective responsibility. And unless all sectors of society, individuals, corporations, and government pull together in the same direction, I think we're, we're doomed nutritionally. We are heading for very clear disaster. And, and this is a disaster not only of, of in, in the health sense, but disaster in the economic sense that has huge implications. Now, one of the, for the past 35 years, I have been working to develop a new paradigm of medicine and health care. I have promoted and used the name of integrative medicine. And let me just define for you what this is. The short answer is that integrative medicine is the intelligent combination of ideas and practices of conventional medicine and alternative medicine. I don't much like the term alternative medicine. It suggests that you're, we're trying to do things in place of standard medicine, and that has never been my idea. Integrative medicine begins with the recognition that conventional medicine does some things extremely well and that that should always be the first, the first thing you think of when dealing with a serious medical condition. Uh, I often say that if I were in a serious automobile accident, I wouldn't want to first be taken to a practitioner of Ayurveda or acupuncture or shamanism. I would love to go to a high-level trauma center and get put back together, but then as soon as I could, I might use other methods that I know about to speed up the healing process. I mean, that's, if I have an acute bacterial pneumonia, I would want to be treated with antibiotics. That seems to me obvious. But it's astonishing how infrequently patients and doctors make those distinctions. In general, allopathic medicine has become more and more specialized and effective at dealing with 
critical situations with very serious disease, with disease involving vital organs, with disease that's moving very rapidly. In those instances, it is appropriate to use allopathic methods first, but even then, I think it is very useful to combine them with other methods that can moderate the toxicity of allopathic interventions, particularly pharmaceutical drugs, as well as support the body's own defenses and healing functions. But in many other kinds of illness, and especially the diseases of lifestyle, many of the chronic degenerative illnesses, allopathic medicine is much less effective. And there the balance of judging benefits versus risk does not come out so favorably. And in those instances, it seems to me, especially if there's time to wait, it is certainly worth trying interventions that are simpler, cheaper, more natural, that may take longer to work, that may be less dramatic in their effects, but that over time can produce as good or better results. But, and I also don't like much the term complementary medicine, which has become popular in many parts of the world. That sounds much too polite to me and suggests that what you're trying to do is to keep allopathic medicine as the centerpiece and have little garnishes around it. In fact, much of what I see that goes on in the name of integrative medicine today or holistic medicine is really complementary. It's, it's adding things to an allopathic centerpiece. And that is not my idea either. Uh, to me, integrative medicine means a true marriage. It's really an, an inclusive system that draws on the best aspects, the best ideas and practices of all systems that are out there. Um, but I think integrative medicine is much more than simply bringing new therapies into the mainstream. I mean, I think that's great, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. But our integrative medicine movement, which is quite strong now in the U.S. and in other parts of the world, really has larger um, purposes. One of them is to restore the focus of medicine on health and healing and away from disease and the management of symptoms. I think this is one of the, the most apt criticisms of conventional medicine. It is entirely focused on disease once it's established and management of symptoms. And I think this, given the, the health crisis that's engulfing us, the, the aspect of integrative medicine that really is health promoting stands out. Secondly, integrative medicine insists that people are more than physical bodies, that we are also mental, emotional beings, spiritual entities, community members, and these other aspects of human life are very relevant to understanding health and illness. And unless medicine takes those into account, it has cut itself off from large areas of intervention in which many kinds of disease can be modified, often through relatively simple, low-cost techniques, particularly in the area of mind-body medicine, which is now very well researched and has a very good scientific foundation to it. Uh, you may know, you may have read that, for example, in the past few years, we have new techniques of brain imaging, like functional MRIs and PET scans, that enable us to visualize living brains. And this has totally changed the approach to mind-body medicine. Uh, things that would have been dismissed easily as mystical a few years ago, states of consciousness, for example, or the changes that happen in people th through meditation practice, can now be correlated with actual tangible changes in brain function. This has put this whole area of mind-body medicine on a, on a totally new footing. Integrative medicine also insists that we look at all aspects of lifestyle in understanding health and illness. That means inquiring about how people eat, how they exercise or don't, how they rest and sleep, what they do for fun, the nature of their relationships. Um, all of this, how they handle stress, all of this is relevant to the equation of health and illness. And again, by inquiring in these areas, it's often possible to see ways in which you can intervene to change people's lifestyle at much lower cost and risk than simply prescribing drugs. And finally, integrative medicine insists that the interaction between a doctor and a patient is very relevant to the healing process. One of the great tragedies that's happened in my country where medicine has become a for-profit system taken over by corporations is that the amount of time that doctors have to spend with patients has been cut to the point where it's almost impossible for this kind of productive healing relationship to form. If you've got 
five or seven minutes with a patient, it's probably not impossible, but it's very unlikely that you can form the kind of relationship that can foster healing. In some countries like Japan, this is even worse, where doctors now typically see 30 patients an hour and are called two-minute doctors. You know, completely, and not only has this made things much the worse for patients, it has also made things very difficult for physicians because throughout history, the the relationship with a patient, which in many cultures has been considered sacred, has been the source of greatest emotional satisfaction in practicing medicine. So in, contempor in the contemporary world, in many places, the, the destruction of this by the systems of healthcare that have enveloped medicine are responsible for growing unhappiness and frustration of physicians as well as of patients. And I think this is one reason why many, many doctors come to us, for example, at the University of Arizona for the kind of training training uh, that we offer. Now, finally, and this is what integrative medicine is most known for, is this idea of bringing other therapies into the mainstream. And this is interesting. You know, the, 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 the hostility and resistance of many mainstream physicians to ideas and practices that come from out there is very interesting to watch. This is always rationalized in terms that these things have no scientific basis, that they're unproven, that they're potentially dangerous. Now, in one sense, this is people in glass houses throwing stone because a great deal of conventional medical therapy does not have a solid scientific basis either. And the methods of allopathic medicine, because they're stronger, are much more productive of harm. The, uh, the former dean of the University of Arizona College of Medicine, uh, Jim Dolan, a very eminent cardiologist who for years was editor-in-chief of the Archives of Internal Medicine, was a great supporter of our program, and without him it would never have been founded and developed, said on his retirement, first of all, that his greatest achievement that he was most proud of was setting up this program. But he also said that one of the things that he learned was that how physicians and scientists react to new information, to unfamiliar information, is more a function of the source of the information than the content. That if information comes from an unfamiliar source, there is an instinctive, reflexive resistance to it. An example that he liked to use from his own field was the incredible amount of time, almost four decades, it took for doctors, cardiologists in particular, to realize that aspirin was a very useful remedy to thin the blood and prevent heart attacks. This was an observation first made in the 1950s by a general practitioner in Southern California who noted this was the era when uh, all kids in America had their tonsils taken out. You couldn't make it to adolescence with your tonsils in those days. And it was common to give kids after the operation a product called aspergum to chew, which was an aspirin preparation. And this doctor noticed that the kids who chewed aspergum had bleeding in their throats longer than kids who didn't chew aspergum. And it occurred to him that maybe aspirin had an anticoagulant property. So he started taking aspirin himself and noticed that when he cut himself shaving that it bled longer. He wrote a paper in a journal of general practice proposing that aspirin was a blood thinning medication and might have utility in reducing risk of heart attacks. It took 40 years for the conventional medical and cardiology community to accept that and the reason for the resistance was that this came from a general practitioner and was published in a journal that cardiologists didn't read. Now imagine when this information comes from something much farther afield. For example, somebody talking about the virtues of Chinese medicine or a plant that grows in the Amazon, that there is this instinctive resistance. What I uh, teach the physicians and students who come through my program is that it would be very useful to get in the habit of using a sliding scale of evidence that works this way. The greater the potential of a treatment to cause harm, the stricter the standards of evidence it should be held to for efficacy. I think that makes a great deal of sense and would enable us to cut through a lot of the confusion out there. There's so many therapies. There's so many things out there. We don't have time to assess them all through randomized controlled trials. But I think that this way of thinking, that the more potential harm a treatment can cause, that's when you want to hold it to stricter standards of scientific evidence. If we adopted that principle religiously in conventional medicine, I think we would have saved ourselves a lot of trouble and saved patients a lot of toxicity.